Breeder was planning the heist as early as 2012, but didn't return to the vault on that second night. Detectives were watching as they met in cafes and pubs. The group were coming together. It was now a, a, a game, a patience game on our part. Um, and that paid off when John Collins, Brian Reader and um, Terence Perkins met. 67-year-old Terence Perkins was responsible for the drilling. He's also got form and served 22 years in prison. Perkins and Collins were telling Brian Reader when they went back how they were successful in the end. Detectives soon pieced together who the other gang members were. Daniel Jones is again uh, an organised criminal. He's younger, fitter, and that's what he brings to the group. It's believed he climbed down the lift shaft and squeezed through the hole into the vault. Carl Wood was also part of planning the heist and there on the first night, but he pulled out on the second day when he's thought to have bottled it. And then there's the red-haired man, the gang referred to as Basil. A mysterious character, his true identity is still unknown. As detectives identified the gang members, they also planted electronic listening bugs on two of their cars, including Collins' Mercedes. It is a tactic that is used in serious crime investigations and can be quite productive. Uh, and obviously it was very productive on this occasion. We were able to obtain recordings of their conversations and we know that they were quite excited about the fact that they'd got away with such a large-scale offence and it was unlikely that the police would have any idea of what had taken place or who to look for and they were quite comfortable in the fact that they were away scot-free. The men couldn't help boasting, totally unaware, the police were listening to every word. The audio recordings of the conversation which told us exactly how they'd done it, who they'd done it with, uh, how they're going to sort out the property. So for us, obviously, it was a gold mine of um, evidence. Six weeks after the heist, members of the gang met in a pub car park in North London to move some of the loot. It'd be one thing to arrest the group together, but what we wanted was property. This was the moment the three bags containing diamonds, watches and necklaces were shifted from a taxi into Collins' Mercedes. The three bags that have been exchanged behind uh, the, the pub contained at this point uh, an estimated two to four million pounds worth of diamonds and gold. With the exchange done, Collins and Jones drove in the distinctive Mercedes to a nearby property with the flying squad on their tail. We had weeks of surveillance showing the principals meeting up. We had the audio recording saying what they'd done and how they were going to do it. And eventually we had some property coming out of the woodwork. So at that point, we've got sufficient there. There'd be no reason to delay the rest any longer. So uh, that was why we made a decision at that point to go in. The police made their move. In coordinated raids with more than 200 officers, they hit 12 addresses in London and Kent. They were surprised, obviously very disappointed. They would still have been, no doubt, actively in their minds trying to work out how they're going to minimise their criminal responsibility. It's not until they're interviewed and they obviously will walk through the evidence that we had against them that they realised how comprehensive the investigation had been against them and the amount of trouble that they were in at that point in time. But they weren't saying much in police interviews. Were you a driller? No comment. Were you the person that could deactivate the lift shafts? No comment. The alarm systems? <clears throat> no comment. Was it you that messed up? No comment. It was your role, wasn't it, to um, get through the hole? No comment. Jones and the three other ringleaders, Reader, Collins and Perkins, saw the writing on the wall and confessed. To have four who spent three years in the planning for this offence, 
to plead before going to trial basically shows and is rewarding enough for us to say that we've done the right job and we're starting to do the right thing for the victims. From his cell at Belmarsh Prison, Danny Jones offered to give up his stash of the loot, claiming he wanted to go straight. He said he'd hidden it at Edmonton Cemetery in North London. Police searched a grave, digging for around two hours, uncovering jewellery and precious stones. A week later, they returned, this time taking Jones from his cell. He led them to a different grave. He was unaware police had already discovered the first larger hall. The flying squad had recovered some of the stolen property and they had their four ringleaders. Another three men had also been charged. They pleaded not guilty and went on trial. Last month, the jury delivered its verdict. Carl Wood and William Lincoln were both convicted for their roles in the burglary and for dealing with the hall. Another man, Hugh Doyle, was found guilty of helping the gang distribute the loot. The guilty men are now serving time. Well, all except one, that is. The mysterious red-haired man, Basil, or whatever his real name is, seems to have got away with it, for now. He's still out there somewhere, along with 10 million pounds of missing loot. Well, it really is an incredible story, but it's not quite over yet. The head of the Flying Squad, Detective Superintendent Craig Turner, is here with the latest on the elusive Basil. He is an intriguing character. I mean, he seemed to have got them in in the first place. You must be closing in on, on him by now. Well, the uh, purpose of me here today is to uh, uh, appeal to members of the public. We're offering £20,000 for information that leads to the arrest and conviction of the person we call Basil. Um, what we know about Basil is that, obviously, he allowed the group to, to enter into the deposit box area uh, via the front door using a key. We think he's wearing a wig, yeah, and we're not too sure whether his name is, in fact, Basil. The group referred to him as Basil, but we don't think that's his true, true name. Um, he's obviously walked into the Hatton Garden area. He was very, very elusive to CCTV, so therefore he could be local to the area. So we're appealing to members of the public that may have seen anything suspicious on the lead-up to the Easter Bank holiday weekend. Because he really did take real sort of pains to disguise himself, didn't he? He did. From the CCTV, he's carrying the uh, case uh, or bag uh, on his shoulders, uh, and I would have said he would have known where that CCTV was and would have known the actual area. And they took £14 million worth of property. You've recovered about £4 million, but £10 million is still missing. And these are some of the items that you're interested in finding. It is, and uh, we're extremely victim-focused. Uh, we've restored £3.7 million worth of jewellery back, back to victims. And we're going to take our time to make sure that, obviously, those items of jewellery get back to the rightful owners. Um, I would appeal to members of the public and also people that are involved in the jewellery industry, um, if they're ever offered uh, um, items of jewellery in suspicious circumstances, circumstances uh, or bespoke items such as these that will be shown on the website uh, to contact the incident room. Okay. Thank you. And if you think you can help the Flying Squad bag their man, please do get in touch using the numbers on screen. Also, if you've been a victim of any crime, you may want to speak to victim support. They are on 0808 16 89 111.